This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. There are some stories we do here that make us feel enlightened, and there are some stories we do here that make us feel a little nervous. But this one felt like a bucket of ice water poured over my head. You see, in northern Ethiopia, along the border with Eritrea, lies the region of Tigray, where a civil war has been bubbling along for the last few months. There have been very few journalists who have been able to visit the region, and actual reporting on the conflict has been fairly sparse. Here at the show, we've been following the story lightly over the last few months, and would eventually get around to doing a piece on it. But all of that changed about two weeks ago. I've been working with a friend of mine who works in the US Intel community, on a completely different story. When on our break, we were chatting about Ethiopia, and he was nice enough to forward through some of the satellite photos from the conflict area. And those photos are what prompted us to do this story. What is immediately obvious from the photos is the litany of burnt-out houses, destroyed vehicles, decimated crops, and the large columns of refugees trying to escape the firefights between the Tigrayan separatists and the Ethiopian forces. But there was something I couldn't identify. There was these large, pale blue dots throughout all of them. They were everywhere, along roads, next to houses, outside schools. It looked like a speckled blue egg wherever I looked. So I asked my analyst friend, what are these blue dots? His answer will stick with me for a long time. They mark mass graves. With no journalists being allowed into the area, the locals are desperate to show the world what is happening in Tigray. They've taken to painting big rocks blue in the hope that the satellites pick up the images, crying out for someone to realize just how devastating this war is. The war was launched on the day of the US election, knowing the world will be distracted, and the war is still being raged with no correspondence to cover it, hoping that the world remains distracted. Already tens of thousands of people are dead, and millions more are now starving under this iron-fisted siege. What is happening on the ground in Tigray is tantamount to genocide, and I do not use that word lightly. But it may not just be the Tigrayans who suffer here. This conflict has the ability to destabilize the entire region along with it, and the mosaic nation of Ethiopia may be about to shatter. But to take us through all this, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Mosaic I think Ethiopia is entering into an extremely fragile uh, situation. As we speak, the Tigrayan forces have gone beyond the Tigray territory. They are entering Amhara and Afar regional states in pursuit of uh, the federal army. Uh, the instability which was earlier seen in Tigray and part of Oromia on behalf of the Oromo insurgency, will possibly spread to other regional states. The center, the federal government, is increasingly weaker. It doesn't have the capacity to have military control of its territory. It doesn't even have the capacity to have political control of its territory. So it is a danger that Ethiopia is... Um, inching towards maybe a full state collapse. Chietel Tronville is a professor of peace and conflict studies at Bjorkens University in Norway. He's also the director of the think tank Oslo Analytica and a renowned author on issues surrounding East Africa and conflicts in the region. He joins us today. The explanation to the fact that Ethiopia managed to remain as the only African state which was never externally colonized was due to, I think, a number of factors. Key of this, obviously, were its military capacities and capabilities. The emperor managed to mobilize a peasant army of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of men, and he had some very, very good officers and generals leading the troops in battle, particularly against the Italians, which then tried to colonize Ethiopia uh, at that time. Uh, the terrain, as you said, work in their favor, a very rugged, mountainous terrain, difficult to do uh, rapid advancements in, in the highlands when you have an infantry army, as the colonial armies were. 
but also the fact that Ethiopia had a central authority. They had a central government, and it was even Christian. Ethiopian state were Christian and had been so for centuries, a long time before the European states, actually. And that made, and you know, the Ethiopian government were known in Europe through diplomatic uh, contact and envoys, which the emperor sent to Europe throughout the Middle Ages. So it was a known state entity prior to the colonial race on Africa. That also helped. To give us a bit more context about Ethiopian history, after the era of the Ethiopian Empire, in 1974, the country underwent a coup and became the Communist People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia and became very close with the Soviet Union. Can you take us through this era, as well as their wars with the neighboring US-backed Somalia at the time? Yeah, the Horn of Africa uh, during the Cold War was a you know, geopolitical hotspot. Uh, the proxy wars between USA and Soviet Union were fought on the ground in the Horn of Africa. And uh, uh, throughout, uh, you know, from the mid-1970s, and onwards to the end of the Cold War, Soviet Union uh, heavily supported Ethiopia um, in the war uh, against the insurgencies in Arit- from Eritrean Liberation Front, but also against TPLF, the Tigray insurgency. And the US and the Western allies, so to say, had allied with um, Mogadishu um, in, in, in trying to stem off the Soviet influence in the Horn. But it was particularly the Soviet Union's main backer of uh, the Ethiopian military junta, the DERG, which um, actually helped the junta to survive as long as they did because of the heavy military supplies shipped in and military advisors and so on given by Soviet Union and also Cuba at that time. Uh, with the collapse of the Berlin War and the um, end of the Cold War, so to say, in 1989, um, Soviet Union withdrew or ceased the military support to Ethiopia, which then uh, contributed to the rapid downfall then of Mengistu Haile Mariam's regime in 1991. So, um, and in the 1990s, uh, the Horn of Africa was kind of forgotten as a geopolitical arena. It came back again after 9-11 and the war on terror, which U.S. then were heavily involved uh, supporting the Ethiopian EPRDF government in the fight against uh, Al-Shabaab, for instance, in Somalia and other uh, jihadist movements in the area. Well, you just mentioned a very important play to this story, the TPLF, or Tigrayan People's Liberation Front who have been fighting the EPLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, for quite a long time now. It's one of the major reasons there are the two separate nations of Eritrea and Ethiopia today, with Eritrea voting to secede from Ethiopia in 1993, and then a subsequent full-scale war between the two nations over disputed territory between them. Can you take us through this period and why the TPLF are so crucial to understanding the story on the ground today? Isaiah Zawarki, the president of Eritrea, uh, framed this conflict as a conflict between EPLF and TPLF and between Eritrea and Tigray. He didn't really phrase it as an Eritrean all-Ethiopian conflict. The first one to mobilize on the Ethiopian side after the attack in May 1998 were the old TPLF guerrilla army which were called back to service by the regional president of Tigray at that time. Uh, a couple of days later, Meles Zenawi, then prime minister of Ethiopia, uh, ordered a general mobilization of the Ethiopian federal army also to come to the rescue, so to say, because it was an attack on Ethiopian sovereignty and territorial integrity, as it was interpreted by Addis Ababa. But the key Military leaders during that two years of warfare and its key political leaders were all more or less from Tigray. Um, they were the uh, leading uh, generals uh, in the war. Uh, Lieutenant General Tzadkan were the chief of staff uh, at that time. 
Uh, and uh, Melissa obviously was the prime minister and um, and the key kind of political actors on the Ethiopian side were more or less all from TPLF during that time. So so that is the key. It was the key enemy for Isaiah Safwerki in 1998-2000 war, which then leads us to the current situation where again Isaiah Safwerki defied TPLF and Tigray as the key enemy of, uh, of Eritrea. Tigrayans only make up about 6% of the Ethiopian population. So how did they manage to become the main power brokers in Ethiopia, disproportionately occupying many of the important levels of government, even though they're quite a small minority compared to some of the larger Ethiopian groups? Well, basically, it was because it was the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, uh, who were the the core, the biggest, the most structures, the most ideological coherent fighting force in Ethiopia in 1991. At that time, at the fall of the Derg, you had about 15, 16 different ethnic resistant movements fighting in the country against the center. Uh, But in 1989, when TPLF had managed to gain control of all Tigray. They redefined the struggle, not only to kind of get self-determination and control of Tigray, but also to topple the Dur military junta to establish a democratic governance structure in Ethiopia. At that time, they established what is called EPRDF, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, inviting in, or as it is claimed, creating uh, parties representing the Oromo people, the southern people, and then also the Amhara people into that umbrella front in order to, to give them um, to get legitimacy, so to say, to carry on the fighting beyond Tigray. But it was always TPLF who were the strong party component within the EPRDF coalition, who then assumed government control in 1991. TPLF has been a remarkable ideological driven party, and that has been its strength, but it has also been its weakness, so to say, because they have always believed that we know the best. We know the ideological doctrines of Marxism. We know how to mobilize and organize the peasantry. We know how to design development visions and strategies. And the rest of you should basically take the back seat. Um, and uh, but but that very very strong leadership structure in TPLF and the strong ideological driven commitment to change Ethiopia and to develop Ethiopia, not the least, uh, gave it its strength to control the center. Uh, until of course the passing away of Prime Minister Meles Zenawi in. 2012, as the strong man, as the ideological leader, as the political leader of the front, that's when we see that the TPLF grip of power started to wither. And then later on, you had the popular protest movements and also the internal power struggle, which led to the fall of TPLF, so to say, is control of EPRDF and the coming to power of the Oromo component and Abiy Ahmed. Before we get into Abiy Ahmed, can we talk a little bit about the actual structure of the Ethiopian government? The Ethiopian nation is made up of many different people groups and regions. So how centralized is the government in the country's capital, Addis Ababa? Does the capital have full control over all of the regions? Or is the country far more decentralized due to the fact that there are so many tribes and ethnicities in the region? Yes, and I think that's what very relevant to keep in mind today when the current conflict is also viewed as a conflict over what Ethiopia should be, how the Ethiopian state should be organized, the centralization of power or the devolution of power. Um, Because you have to keep in mind that the Ethiopian constitution which was enacted in 1995 but which was basically drafted in the early 1990s after the takeover of EPRDF, um, that constitution is in itself a compromise, a political compromise on how can we 
stay together? And how can we maintain the territorial integrity of Ethiopia? As I said, at that time, in the early 1990s, it was only ethnic-based resistance movements left in the country. The pan-Ethiopian nationalist movements, particularly the EPRP, had been kicked out during the 1970s and 80s. And they were not invited back in to join in the transitional process, so to say, in 1991. So it was it was all the kind of the ethnic discourse which was the game in town. And what TPLF said, with the strong support by the Orumo Liberation Front at that time, which was the second biggest fighting force in the country, they said that for us, for the minorities or for the periphery, for the people who have been suppressed by what they claimed was an Amharized centralizing state, for centuries, for us to regain trust in the center, for us to have confidence in Ethiopia again, we need to find a system where political autonomy and even political sovereignty rests with the nation, nationalities and peoples of Ethiopia, with the ethnic group, basically, of the country. So we need to design a federal system which devolves power to the regional level. It's not even that. In the Ethiopian constitution, it says actually that the sovereign entities, the sovereignty in Ethiopia, it doesn't rest with the state. Sovereignty rests with the ethnic groups. And it is the ethnic groups which have given sovereignty to the center, not the other way around. Uh, and that you have a strong self-determination rights, political autonomy at the regional state level. You even have uh, political autonomy at the sub-regional state level too. And they went even further in kind of guaranteeing that never again should any people in Ethiopia feel threatened by the center. And if so happens, they gave everyone an exit clause, an option either to seek the status of a regional state. If you are a small ethnic group, you could, you, could, you could go through a process claiming regional statehood. And if that wasn't satisfactory to make you reassured about your role in, under the federation, you could even leave the federation and establish a separate sovereign state. That says so in Article 39 in the Ethiopian Constitution. This was embedded in order to not to make it happen, at least that is the initial idea, but to create confidence by the minorities to the central government. Because Ethiopia has throughout its existence always been ruled <laughs> Uh, by a suppressive, centralizing, Amharized government. I'm saying Amharized because the government hasn't been Amhara. But those in power have always spoken Amhara, have been Orthodox Christian, have been using the symbols and traditions of the Amhara nation, basically. That's why... Uh, we talk about the Amharized state. But anyone within the empire could rise to prominence as long as he or she spoke Amhara, uh, subscribed to Orthodox Christianity earlier, and identified with the state. Like the Emperor Haile Selassie, it's half Orum or even more. You know, it, the Orumos have always been part of the palace, so to say, in Ethiopia. But never as Orumus. <laughs> they have always uh, needed to claim then an identity as something else beyond Orumus. So that's the complexities of the statehood in Ethiopia. And it has about you know 85 to 90 different ethnic groups in the country, which then potentially, constitutionally, can seek either regional statehood or even separation and sovereignty.
So a lot of the dynamics here dramatically change in 2008 when Abiy Ahmed comes to power as the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. He is very different from previous leaders. He seeks to end the decade-long stalemate with Eritrea, bolster the strength and the abilities of the Ethiopian central government, and is also not to grind. What impact does the election of Abiy Ahmed have on Ethiopia? You know, first of all, the power struggle within EPRDF really gaining speed, so to say, or prominence around 2016, based also reflecting also the popular protests at that time, particularly by the Edo youth movement, the Urumo youth movement, and later the Fano, the Amhara youth movement, which was capitalized on by the component parties within the EPRDF to position themselves against TPLF, basically, against TPLF's control of the party. And it was the Urumos who who put up the biggest challenge, so to say. And that clique of Urumo leaders were at that time called Team Lemma, because Lemma Magersa became the chairperson of uh, OPDO, the Urumo Component Party of EPRDF, later renamed to Urumo Democratic Party, ODP. And when the, that uh, struggle intensified, it also stifled all kind of political reforms, all kind of development visions, since they were the government fighting each other. So they didn't have time, so to say, to rule. And um, in order to try to avoid a crisis, in 2017, the EPRDF Council accepted and acknowledged a lot of self-criticism based on human rights abuse, corruption, maladministration, and so on and so forth, and accepted also to start implementing a raft of reforms. Radical reforms were agreed upon in EPRDF in 2017. But because of the power struggle was not over, those reforms were not implemented. And Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalegn at that time understood that he, representing a small southern minority group, didn't have the political clout, didn't have the political power, didn't have the political backing to enforce the reforms. So he then finally made the move to resign his position as chair of EPRDF and hence then as prime minister in order to open up in full the internal power struggle to get the new leadership who could be powerful enough to institutionalize the reforms. And that's when um, uh, the period before that when the Orumu party saw that we might have the opportunity actually now to get the chairmanship of EPRDF if we play it right, and hence then we'll get the prime ministership. So Lemma Magesa, who were the leader of the Orumu party, he was not a representative in the parliament of Ethiopia. And since it is a parliamentary system, the prime minister has to come from the parliament. So in order not to uh, miss the opportunity that Oromo should get the prime ministership, Lemma Mergesa changed positions with Abi Ahmed. Abi was his deputy within the party because Abi was in the House of Representatives. And he became the chair of ODP. And then they won the internal vote within the EPRDF about the new chair and hence the new prime minister. That vote was initially split, that the TPLF, they recommended, they nominated the new representatives from the south. Uh, Amharas initially nominated one of their own, and the Oromo party uh, nominated uh, Abiy Ahmed. When the Amharas saw that they were not capable of winning the vote internally, they withdrew their candidate and backed Abiy because then they had the majority with some sudden votes to claim the chairmanship. So in a sense, Abbey's rose to power is by default, not by design. It was originally tended to be Lema Malgelsa, to use that term. Then the situation would have been totally different today because Lema is an ardent ethno-federalist. He support the current constitution. Abbey Ahmed, when he came to power, he had the mandate, so to say, to institutionalize the reforms, to implement the reforms, which were already agreed upon the year before. 
And it was a radical change overnight in Ethiopia at that time. Uh, he opened up uh, a democratic plural discourse from one day to the other. And he came with some, uh, he uttered some remarkable statements, positive statements of uh, reform interest. He also accepted blame. As he said, we have been conducting state terrorism in Ethiopia uh, against our own people. And he said, we are all to blame. We are all, meaning all EPRDF, to blame for the state terrorism. Uh, but he also said, we cannot arrest ourselves because then there is no one to lead the country. So we have to forgive and forget and move forward. Uh, which was kind of accepted by many, but also criticized by some that it should have been some sort of uh, some sort of accountability for the human rights abuses committed during the EPRDF reign in power. The radical reform institutionalized in a in from April and onwards in Ethiopia in 2018. Uh, was embraced by all Ethiopians, and particularly by Tigrayans. Abiy received a huge support by Tigrayans because, and that's paradoxical, I know many Ethiopians don't actually believe this, but the TPLF control of Tigray, political control, had been 100% more or less. Nowhere was it difficult, as in Tigray, to be an opposition member, to be a, representing an opposition. So, and the TPLF had received a lot of criticism from the Tigrayan grassroots the years prior to the change in EPRDF, where the Tigrayans demanded a change of uh, policy and accountability. So, at, in the initial phase, Abiy received support by all Ethiopians across the board, you can say. One of the biggest achievements in the early days of Abiy's rule was the ending of the war with Eritrea something that Abe would win the Nobel Peace Prize for. So how did he actually end the war? And why would Eritrea, a nation regularly known as the North Korea of Africa, agree to a peace deal with Ethiopia? And when Abe took power um, in 2018, he very quickly, yes, made public speeches saying that we need to settle our discord with our brothers in Eritrea. And I believe he sincerely meant it in the sense that he saw the need and the interest for both countries and to open up again the borders, to reconnect again because of an economic advantage and because of his agenda of economic integration in the Horn of Africa. And he needed Eritrea on board on that. But it is also more and more information, and particularly these days, about the interest of Abiy to get help to marginalize TPLF, so to say, from power at the federal level. Because after taking, assuming the chairmanship of um, EPRDF, obviously Abiy knew that the stiffest resistance to his new visions would come from TPLF. And in that regard, it was also opportune for him to bring President Isaias on board in that endeavor. But uh, we know that Isaias kept quiet for two months after Abiy Ahmed uh, reached out with his olive branch, so to say, and asked for peace. Isaias didn't comment upon it. It didn't change. And we know that there were uh, confidential communications, so to say, between Asmara and Addis during this period. And Isaias was not really comfortable with or not really sure of that it really had been a change of power in Addis. Because TPLF was still part of the government and of EPRDF. So he didn't really trust Abiy. That as long as, you know, I see TPLF still is around at Arat Kilo in the government offices, can I really trust you? And you need to prove that you have control and not TPLF. And that proof came in early June 2018 when Abiy dismissed 
the chief of staff and also dismissed the head of the National Intelligence Agency. Both staunch Tigrayan <laughs> military leaders, you can say. And that was a clear signal to Asmara from Abbe that, you know, I am in control and I am on my way to remove the Tigrayans from key positions in the military security sector. And it was just after that, on 21st of June 2018, the, on Martyr's Day, that is President Isaias Afwerki came out with a speech in Asmara saying that his infamous words, saying it's game over for TPLF, uh, there has been a change in Addis, we are interested to talk with the new leadership. And from his first statements and onwards, from Isaias, it is clear that Isaias's interest, is, interest was never peace as such. Isaias's motivation and interest were to continue the war against TPLF through other means. Now he had an ally in Addis against his war on TPLF and Tigray. And again, that is proof in that pudding in the sense that it took some months until September, mid-September, before the borders between Eritrea and Ethiopia opened up on the ground. You had the restoration of diplomatic uh, relations and of uh, flights from Asmara to Addis in um, uh, July already. But it took another two months before they opened the borders on the ground. And nobody really knew why. Why, should, why couldn't they reconnect immediately? And um, when we saw that, I was in Tigray during this period, uh, doing field work, and when we saw the border open again in uh, mid-September, uh, it was a huge influx of people, Eritreans to Tigray, Tigrayans to Eritrea, reconnected with families and relatives and old friends, visiting each other, embracing each other, saying, finally, we are reconnected. Because again, the main border between Eritrea and Ethiopia is between Eritrea and Tigray. And you saw a huge boom in um, uh, trade between Eritrea and Tigray. And that scared President Isaias. Because who actually benefited by opening the border? Who benefited from the peace agreement? It was the Tigrayans. And that was not his intention, not at all. So rather quickly, end of December 2018, Isaias closed the border again on the ground, unilaterally, without consulting of this even, it is, I have been told. Because he saw a, a double threat. He saw a threat that the economic advantages of this would benefit Tigray and TPLF-owned businesses, uh, and uh, also, it would benefit ordinary Eritreans out of control of the one-party state in Eritrea. And he didn't like that. But maybe even more importantly was the fact that the thousands and thousands of Eritreans flocking into Tigray during those three months, they saw a Tigray which was, in their eyes, hugely developed. Uh, they saw modern cities. They saw affluence in the shops. You could buy whatever you wanted. Not like in their own home country. And because they had been told a lie for 20 years, both that Tigray was impoverished and backward, and Eritrea is developed, in a sense, but more so they have been told that Tigrayans are our enemy. And uh, all Eritreans were welcomed warmly in Tigray during that time. And they brought back a different narrative back home to Eritrea saying that, you know, what is really, why have we been closed off for 20 years? Why have our constitution not been implemented for 22 years? Why have we been not being allowed to have elections, to develop, to have private property, to have private enterprises? Why are we kept hostage in our own country when we see that we can be peaceful with Tigray and Ethiopia? And that narrative directly challenged President Isaias' grip on power 
and he needed to cut it short. So he closed the border again by the end of December 2018. So that more or less brings us to the current situation we're in today, where there is a bloody civil war raging between the central Ethiopian government, who has allied themselves with the central Eritrean government, against the Tigrayans. How did this war begin? What was the spark that set this all off? I have said several times that this war has been the best announced war to come in Africa for decades. We all knew it, it would happen long term before the actual outbreak of war. Already in 2016, I had interviews with top level TPLF, EPRDF leaders who said that we are going towards war. Uh, because of the internal differences which came to the fore within the government party structure. From the TPLF side, I'm not saying they are correct, but they interpreted it, as this representative told me, that the Amhara component party was taken over by Derg remnants, they said. The Amhara component party was becoming increasingly chauvinist in their terminology. And for anyone who has read up and who knows Ethiopian modern history and knows <laughs> the TPLF struggle, understands that this terminology brings back memories of the Derg regime, the regime they fought against for 17 years. So phrasing the internal differences within EPRDF in such terminology was extremely serious. Um, then the real trigger to the war happened in December 2019 after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed had been to Oslo to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Two days thereafter, after returning to Addis, he proclaims the dissolution of EPRDF and the establishment of the new government party, Prosperity Party, as a unitary party. That was the key trigger to the war. Immediately thereafter, TPLF came out with a number of statements saying that the process of uh, abolishing EPRDF is uh, unlawful, is illegal, both in relation to the EPRDF bylaws, but also in relation to the Ethiopian election law and the Ethiopian constitution. And since he has illegally dissolved the government party, the new party established, Prosperity Party, they said, was also in breach with Ethiopian election law and in breach with Ethiopian constitution. Its, its, its establishment was in breach with the procedures outlined in Ethiopian election law. And they came out with statements saying that we consider the Ethiopian government as illegal. Already in December 2019, TPLF said that and withdrew from the government and withdrew, you know, declined to join the new party. That's what, when the war really started. Uh, but the, you have a backdrop earlier where everyone knew that things were getting to get nasty. But after December 2019, all sides started to prepare for a military outcome by recruiting, by reorganizing the structure, military structures, by uh, purchasing arms and so on. The second trigger was the postponement of the federal election. Uh, originally, the election should be conducted in May 2020. It was first postponed to August because of um, the new election board was extremely slow in organizing. They didn't have the capacity or capability to really get things going, so to say, with the election preparations. So they first uh, announced the postponement of, of three months. But uh, soon thereafter, the pandemic hit Ethiopia, and it was decided, recommended by the election board to postpone indefinitely, which the government supported. TPLF then said, no, we consider a postponement to be in breach with the Ethiopian constitution, because then the government's tenure will be prolonged. And the government's tenure expires in October 2020. So then TPLF said, because it's not only the federal government and the House of Representatives which expires, all the regional governments and the regional assemblies also expires. 
or expired in October 2020. So TPLF said, we cannot allow this. So if the Federal Election Board cannot conduct elections in Ethiopia, we ask them to conduct elections in Tigray for our regional assembly, because we have control uh, of the corona COVID uh, pandemic, and we will ensure mitigating strategies. Um, the election board declined that request. And in response, the Tigray government said, OK, we will draft a separate regional election law for Tigray, and we will establish a regional election commission in Tigray, which we consider to be within our prerogatives as a, a regional government under the federal constitution of Ethiopia. And hence, that's what they did. In a remarkable short period of time, they drafted the law, they established an election commission, and they established a voter register and conducted voter registration, candidate registration, election campaign, and then conducted the election uh, in September last year. In advance of that, obviously, the rhetoric between Addis and Mekele hardened, and the federal government came out with clear warnings telling the Tigray regional government that if you go ahead and conduct an election, we will look upon that as illegal, as unconstitutional, and we will look upon it as a threat to the federal order, um, and we will make sure to intervene, threatening both with military intervention in advance, but certainly after an election, if it should occur. Um, the election went uh, ahead. It was conducted. I was there to do research and observe it. Uh, in my view, and I have been observing, researching most of the elections in Ethiopia since 1992, it has never been such a plural discourse in Tigray ever in terms of various visions, various opposition parties uh, uh, participating and so on. But everybody in Tigray at that time told me and said quite openly that, you know, this isn't an election as such. This is more a referendum on our self-determination rights and on our individual and collective security. We are threatened in Ethiopia. We feel threatened. We don't feel safe being in Ethiopia any longer. So for us, this isn't a selection between various political parties or development reasons. This is a vote to safeguard ourselves, individually and collectively. And the only one who can protect us is TPLF. And even opposition leaders said this. So it was really a referendum on their collective security and self-determination rights, which also reflect the outcomes of the vote. Immediately after the, that election, or soon thereafter, in um, I think it was 5th of October, when the formal date of expiry of uh, the federal government, according to the Ethiopian constitution, uh, the regional government of Tigray issued a statement saying that we no longer recognize the legitimacy of the federal government. We considered it unconstitutional and illegal. And the federal government reciprocated and said that we don't recognize the regional government of Tigray. And that's the time, just a few days after that, in mid-October, I got information from the ground that the federal authorities and Amhara regional state authorities were starting to deploy military forces along the southern border of Tigray to prepare for the military offensive, to prepare for the military attack, which took place on 4th of November. And actually, just end of October, just that weekend before the 4th of November, I told high-ranking European ambassador in Addis Ababa that my bet is the offensive will start on 4th of November. Because what's happened on 4th of November? It's the US election. Everyone will be preoccupied with what's happening in, in America. No one will take care of what's happening in Tigray. And, well... That's what happened.
Ethiopia has for a long time been the island of stability in the storm that is East Africa. They've been the home to the African Union. They've been peacekeeping throughout the continent. They've been the arbiter of disputes in multiple countries and have been investing in a lot of emerging economies. But now all of that is at risk. The mosaic nation of Ethiopia may be about to shatter. For some like Egypt and Sudan, that may be a win. But for others like Somalia and the Central African Republic, this will add jet fuel to an already out of control blaze. And to talk more about that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. In Denial Well, the situation in Ethiopia, it, um, it's obviously very alarming. It's also incredibly complex, as I'm sure your, your other guests have also outlined. Um, we currently have ongoing uh, military advances at the moment from the Tigrayan forces um, after they retook the capital. Mekele, um, there's, of course, concern about that uh, conflict spreading. The hope right now, of course, is that at least it can be contained uh, within Tigray. Um, um, but, um, and, but at the moment, efforts to, to, to try to resolve it and halt that conflict you know, have have not really been succeeding. We seem to be still very far from finding the political will um, on on either side to to end this conflict. Alan Boswell is a senior analyst for the Crisis Group, specialising in the Horn of Africa. He is also an associate of the London School of Economics Conflict Research Program and the host of the amazing East Africa focused podcast, The Horn. We are very happy to have Alan back on the program today. Yeah, Ethiopia is is really the hegemon uh, of the Horn of Africa region, um, and especially as a hegemon in waiting, um, and I think has been viewed by so by neighboring countries, but also external actors for a far time. Um, it's just far larger than all the other all the other countries. Um, and even though Ethiopia throughout uh, periods of its history has been somewhat inward focused um, under, um, and obviously has been focused on developing its own economy um, under uh, the, the former prime minister, uh, Mele Zanawi, uh, took power in the 1990s um, and and then died um, uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, he he uh, really, after consolidating power in Ethiopia, he then really turned Ethiopia into, you know, the cornerstone of the peace and security sort of architecture, the regional order um, in the Horn of Africa. Um, and, you know, Ethiopia really became sort of the central security partner, uh, especially for the United States um, in, in the Horn of Africa region. Um, he, was, he was quite central and, and therefore Ethiopia was quite central. And um, in, in the sort of alliances and, and uh, strategies that, that regional countries were taking, um, and then also uh, led and was the main point person for a lot of the external actors um, in the region as well, um, not only uh, Western actors, uh, but also, you know, African actors as well. Uh, the Ethiopia, you know, ha had good relations. Um, well, e e under under Prime Minister uh, Mele's um, Ethiopia, you know, uh, brought the African Union uh, to to Ethiopia and made it the headquarters there. So Ethiopia was very strong in African diplomacy, um, but then it, it forged very strong relationships, both East and West, um, you know, with China and the and the U.S. Um, and and uh, was just a really central linchpin, um, basically for for everyone. If this conflict begins to internationalize, who do you think would likely back the Tigrayans? Uh, the Tigrayans don't have any a clear open ally. Uh, there are obviously countries that uh, you know that also have their own uh, diplomatic negotiations going on with Addis Ababa. There's, of course, a lot of speculation that there would be some mutual uh, uh, interests involved if countries wanted to to pressure um, Addis Ababa. Um, and especially that's true with with Egypt, um, which is, you know, engaged with um, uh, in in negotiations over the Nile dam dispute. Um, Ethiopia is building a, a very large dam on on the Blue Nile River and um, or has built it and is filling it, and you know Egypt um, 
uh, considers that a major threat to their own use of the Nile water. Uh, so, so, of course, there's a lot of speculation, you know, that that there could be essentially proxy conflict. Um, there's also escalating tensions between Sudan and Ethiopia. There's a border dispute uh, between the two that has been uh, really heating up since the end of last year. That's in an area called uh, uh, Al Fashika, um, and uh, and Sudan has uh, sort of taken the opportunity of the conflict in Tigray to to reinforce its position and create new facts on the ground. Uh, so there is speculation and has been speculation that Sudan also could could see an alliance with with Tigrayan forces as beneficial. But a lot of this is, is speculation at this point. Um, Tigrayan leaders, of course, because uh, uh, the TPLF was quite dominant in Ethiopia for a while, you know, the, the Tigrayans do have a lot of international contacts. Um, uh, a lot of Tigrayans are well known on the international circuit, um, but uh, there hasn't been any major power who wants to, you know, get involved in in, in supporting a civil war um, in Ethiopia uh, yet. Um, the, the major focus has been, um, as it should be, very much on trying to get the, the both parties um to to stand down and find a, a peaceful resolution to the fighting. Do you think other regions of Ethiopia, like the ethnic Somalians in the Ogadan region, may worry that this move by Addis Ababa will signal intentions for a major concentration of powers in a central state? Will groups like the ethnic Somalis look to get involved in the conflict if things look very dire for the Tigrayans? Well, there's obviously been a lot of concern about the implications of Tigray on other areas of Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is a is a very large country, and there are a lot of uh, pockets of either ongoing um, ongoing fighting or other forms of uh, potential instability. Uh, but we haven't seen we haven't seen the conflict in Tigray yet sort of expand. Uh, across Ethiopia in the way that there is some fear could happen at the beginning of it. With the consequences of this war being so dire, do you think the US or Europe may look to get involved or put peacekeepers on the ground anytime soon? Uh, there's definitely no talk of any sort of, you know, intervention, uh, military intervention. However, the, you know, the, the US is very focused on the humanitarian question um, and not just the US alone. Um, other Western nations, especially, are very focused on this humanitarian, uh, on the need for humanitarian aid to, to get to Tigray. I think we'll see continued uh, pressure. That pressure will definitely be on the diplomatic side, not on the military side. Um, but I do think it will be, um, you know, it's going, that pressure is going to continue rising, um, especially if we start, you know, really seeing images, you know, uh, the images of sort of uh, starvation or famine uh, in Tigray. Ethiopia was seeing big investment from nations all over the world, including China, Russia, and the US. But after this conflict, do you think investors will be hesitant to get involved with Ethiopia any further? Ethiopia is seen as a very large emerging economy in Africa with, with quite a bit of economic potential. Uh, the challenge they will have, of course, is if, uh, is if outside countries start really doubting the stability of Ethiopia. Um, and if people start to see this as a transition that is going off the rails and start to feel, uh, start to fear uh, wider destabilization within Ethiopia, and um, if they especially feel that the conflict is not able to uh, be contained within Tigray, that would uh, obviously uh, uh, present a lot of concerns. The complicating factor here will be Egypt and Sudan. Right now, Ethiopia is building huge hydroelectric dams, the most famous being the Renaissance Dam, along the Upper Nile River. These dams will create electricity for Ethiopia, but they will limit the water downstream that would arrive to Sudan and Egypt, where the Nile is essential to the survival of those countries, with most of their major population centers centered around the Nile River. Ethiopia has refused to back down at this point on filling their dams up, limiting the water supply to Sudan and Egypt. So, do you think Sudan or Egypt may look to use this conflict as leverage in this larger regional dispute? Well, this is the major concern in the region right now about how this conflict could affect the broader Horn of Africa region. Um, 
uh, the relations between Sudan and Ethiopia have been deteriorating. Uh, uh, and that's quite alarming because previously the, the part there was a, you know, the, they had pretty friendly ties between Addis Ababa and Khartoum. However, you've now had both governments, you know, uh, uh, you've had political transitions in which the, the, the government has changed in, in both countries over the last few years. Um, and now, you know, they have issue after issue in which they're not really seeing eye to eye on. Um, and they have this border dispute. They have the Nile Dam dispute. Um, the, and, and there is obviously a fear that if the Tigrayans push west and then open and then, you know, are able to open a border with Sudan, uh, that Sudan could support them. Um, that's that's been quite speculative. Um, there are plenty reasons for both sides to want to de-escalate the situation. The dangers of a border war are quite severe. Um, so so obviously there'll be a lot of uh, diplomatic pressure from the outside, but I also think a lot of people working from inside Sudan who, who don't want to see that sort of escalation. Uh, but it is an obvious concern uh, for everyone working on the region that, that we could see um, all these issues start to get interlinked and, 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 and see uh, relations um, deteriorate uh, possibly into into more violence, but that's something that um, the many people uh, also, you know, are trying to prevent from happening. Many people are claiming that Eritrea's goals in getting involved in this war are simply revenge base against the TPLF. Do you give that any credence or do you think there are bigger objectives here for Asmara? Well, for sure, uh, Eritrea, you know, saw an opportunity to go after uh, the TPLF. Um, you know, they are longtime foes. Um, although once friends of of uh, Mele Sinawi, um, you know, it's also been an opportunity for for him to for President Isaias to go in and retake some border areas um, uh, after the very long Ethiopia Eritrea war. So there's obviously been some clear uh, tactical reasons uh, for him to go in. As to what his long term strategy is now after. Um, after going in and now having his forces sitting on the border, um, you know, I think is 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 not as clear. We haven't seen, we didn't see Eritrea, for instance, provide much backup to uh, the Ethiopian army during this sort of last fighting uh, that occurred in which Ethiopian army later withdrew um, from Mekele. There is a number of people who think that if this war gets any worse for Addis Ababa, it may break any semblance left of a centralized government in Ethiopia and lead to the shattering of the Ethiopian state. What would a collapsing Ethiopia mean for the East African region? I mean, if Ethiopia were to, you know, if worst case scenarios were to come about, uh, I mean, clearly it would be devastating to the region. Um, uh, this is a region that has a very long history of proxy conflict, of conflicts uh, spreading across borders. Um, and, you know, the Horn of Africa, it's not just Ethiopia right now, which is uh, which is undergoing problems. You have uh, major political transitions in several countries. Uh, Sudan, you know, is going through its own political transition after, after the revolution. Sudan ousted Bashir. South Sudan is in the middle of a very... Um, still very fraught peace process. Uh, Somalia is working its way through a major political crisis at the moment um, involving its elections, uh, which, which uh, you know, are on pace to take place, but have been delayed. Um, uh, and so, you know, obviously Ethiopia falling apart would affect those, but also just uh, any, any broader conflict in Ethiopia would, um, you know, just by its sheer size and its position uh, would, would almost inevitably a draw in its its neighbors and and you know and that's something that really no one wants to see so the war began journalists were barred from the areas and both sides looked to settle old scores the ethiopian soldiers looked to settle old debts from when the minority tigrayans had dominated the government of ethiopia and the tigrayans viewed this as a do or die moment for them Stand up now and fight for self-determination, or become a small minority state of a centralized Ethiopia forever. But as we see time and time again in this area of the world, when war gets personal, things become very nasty very quickly. The conflict in the last six months has killed tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians, 
Rape is widespread in the region, and homes are being burnt to the ground with families still inside. This area has become a cauldron for some of the worst atrocities on the planet, and even now, that cauldron is only just beginning to boil. Things are going to get much worse. And to talk more about that, we turn to our second guest. Part 3. It can only get worse from here. Well, I, I've been studying famine and conflict since the mid-1980s. And what's been happening in Tigray, Ethiopia, over the last eight months is more terrible than anything I have seen in my whole professional career. Alex Duval is the executive director for the World Peace Foundation a professor at the Fletcher School of Tufts University, and one of the leading experts on the East African region. Alex is the man everyone from the BBC to the US government turned to for analysis on countries like Ethiopia. And we are thrilled to have him back on the program today. What we had prior to the conflict was a fast developing society. The uh, EPRDF, the previous government in Ethiopia, Ethiopia that came to power in 1991 was criticized for many things. But one thing for which it was universally acclaimed was its effectiveness in uh, abolishing famine in Ethiopia, in developing a food security system, in, in preventing Ethiopians from suffering uh, extreme and needless hunger. And the principal weapon used by the Ethio-Eritrean coalition against the people of Tigray starting in November was starvation. We have, I, I don't think in the last half century, I don't think we have seen such a widespread and systematic uh, perpetration of starvation crimes, of pillage, of destruction of everything that was indispensable to survival, of um, forced displacement, of ransacking and looting medical facilities, of ripping up um, water, of burning crops, of um, destroying every conceivable infrastructure, of raping women to the extent that they are not capable of caring for themselves and their children, just simply haven't seen such a, a, a campaign that frankly verges on the, the genocidal. And the result has been quite predictably that a previously food secure region is now plunged into a widespread food emergency with at the last count um, in, in June, probably 900,000 people facing famine, that number rising by the day. Um, the World Food Programme and USAID estimated that um, 100 trucks a day would be needed to uh, deliver food sufficient to prevent uh, famine during July, August and September. Over the last month, no more than 50 trucks in total have arrived in Tigray. The situation is, is really dire, it is catastrophic. Ethiopian peacekeepers who work around the world are usually regarded and praised for being good, reasonable, disciplined arbiters of peace. It's why they're usually called upon to work in countries all around the continent. So can you take us through the first few months of the conflict and take us through how this became so venomous between the Tigrayans and the Ethiopians? Well, we've gone through three phases in the war. The first was in November of, of 2020, which was... Um, the sort of the headline phase, the headlines from that phase were a conventional assault by the Ethiopian National Defense Force and a militia assault on Western Tigray by neighboring region of Amhara, in which the armed forces associated with the Tigray People's Liberation Front were swiftly defeated. Um, what was not published at the time was that the Eritrean army was massively involved and that there was a, a campaign of drone strikes, almost certainly, though this is not officially confirmed, from the United Arab Emirates, which had been using those drones in, in its war in Yemen. That was followed by a continuing uh, irregular conflict in which the Tigrayans mobilized and it, this was not a mobilization of the TPLF. This was a widespread social mobilization, including 
many veterans who had quit the TPLF years ago and many young people who were fighting for their lives, literally, or their survival or their basic dig dignity. The greatest recruiting sergeant was the mass atrocities perpetrated by the Ethiopians and Eritreans against the people of, of, of Tigray. And that very rapidly mobilized a very large and very effective guerrilla army, which uh, combined with some remarkably poor generalship by the Ethiopians, who presumably were actually believed their own propaganda, thought they won the war, led to a remarkable turnaround in that the Tigran guerrillas overwhelmed and destroyed the majority of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, particularly in a campaign in June drove them out, and then the Eritreans um, thought better of continuing the fight and withdrew. And, and so, um, as we speak, the great majority of Tigray is controlled by the Tigray Defense Forces, and they are moving to, to control the remainder. In this third phase of the war, we're seeing an escalation on both sides. On the Ethiopian government side, they are using siege as their major weapon. They have encircled Tigray and are, have cut off essential supplies and services, not just food, but also electricity, um, banking, uh, any, any supplies of medicine, etc. Meanwhile, the Tigray Defense Forces, which is now equipped with most of the arsenal that the Ethiopian army used to have, it's captured that has moved to expand its area of operations outside Tigray in order to uh, threaten the main uh, transport lifeline to the capital Addis Ababa, which goes from the port of Djibouti. So this, this uh, reciprocal escalation is bringing the, the war really to a head. And there's a choice between either moving rapidly to a negotiated settlement or if the war continues to escalate, I think we the possibility of state collapse in Ethiopia cannot be ruled out. The Tigrayan region is in the north of Ethiopia. It has a tiny border with Sudan, which we'll talk a bit about later, but has the entire northern border with Eritrea. When Ethiopia pushed in from the south at the beginning of the war, Eritrea pushed in from the north, pincering the Tigrayans in the middle. Why is Eritrea involving itself in this internal Ethiopian conflict? The president of, of Eritrea, Sess Afawaki, had a particular grievance against the Tigrayans because the Tigrayans, having been the leading party and the, the major component in the army during the uh, previous 30 years, had fought against him and defeated him. They hadn't removed him from power, but they had actually inflicted a defeat back in, 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 in 2000. And Isaias um, bears a grudge, and he was determined to, in his words, crush Tigray, to, to reduce the people of Tigray to a state in which they could no longer threaten Eritrea, or more to be more precise, threaten him. He also has long had the ambition of weak Ethiopia. He, is, he has seen Ethiopia's aspiration, its pretense to be a, a large, powerful state with a great history, as, as little more than a, a, a myth without foundation in reality. He would much prefer to see Ethiopia weak, a bit more like a, a, a regular African state such as Congo. So he's been determined to undermine and weaken Ethiopia. And his coalition with Prime Minister Abiy, which came about as a result of the, the peace deal made between Abiy and himself um, back in, in, in 2018, um, was intended to achieve both those things, to, to weaken Ethiopia and destroy Tigray. And so when the war was launched in November of last year, this was really very much in pursuit of, of Isaias's um, objectives. With Tigray surrounded on all sides at the moment, weapons and ammunition are becoming a huge problem for the fighting force there. So who is supplying them at the moment? How are they getting guns and ammo to fight this war? There are various wild rumours that they've been getting support, but none of them are actually substantiated. I think partly because um, they were in remote mountainous areas and were inaccessible, and partly because 
um, nobody believed actually that they were going to to reemerge as a as a capable military force. It's certainly true that they uh, they have a major constraint, especially fuel, and that is the reason why they are moving militarily very quickly. They want to be able to secure supply lines uh, before their uh, their supplies begin to run out. This is where the siege is beginning to become a problem for Degray. Ethiopia is holding the southern border, Eritrea is holding the north, and the small road leading from Tigray into Sudan is currently being held by Ethiopian forces. That small road may be the only lifeline Tigray might have open to them. Do you think Sudan will look to help Tigray if the TPLF can recapture the road and open a corridor to the Sudanese border? The Tigray Defence Forces have said they intend to open it. They are not moving fast because it would require a very major military effort on, on that side. And, and there is also a question about what would happen where the line to be opened and Sudan to be drawn into the conflict, because Sudan already has a border dispute um, with Ethiopia. It's in, embroiled in, in, in the uh, dispute over the Renaissance Dam, etc. So it then could become a regional conflagration, which would um, might lead to more supplies to the Tigrayans, but it might also be uh, that escalation of the war may not be to their advantage in that um, Ethiopia might line up with um, other allies uh, in um, precisely because it was becoming an internationalized conflict. If it does become an internationalized conflict, who are the likely players to enter this conflict, though? Is there a possibility of seeing something like the Egyptians and the Sudanese backing the Tigrayans to hurt Ethiopia and the Turkish, who are becoming more and more friendly with Ethiopia, backing Ethiopia in the war, uh, regionalizing this conflict? Scenarios such as that are certainly possible, and they're one reason why the United States and the Europeans have been doing their utmost to, to try and, and contain the conflict, to repress um, Abbey's uh, tendency to escalate at every turn and to keep the domestic civil war in Ethiopia a separate issue from the, the conflicts over the Nile waters with Sudan and Egypt. The Tigrayans have been successfully pushing militarily at the moment, capturing the majority of the Tigrayan state including the regional capital, Mekele. The Ethiopian forces are in retreat at the moment, but what's their reason for that? Why are they pulling back over the border? He had no option. He was driven out. Um, in fact, he didn't want to leave. But his, his, his generals, having lost uh, perhaps 50% of their uh, immediate military capacity, over the previous few weeks, decided to preserve what they had left. And the Ethiopian army is really not a fighting force of, of um, any renown any longer. The forces that, that Abbey is mobilizing are irregular militia. And that's really, um, first of all, just a way of, of getting Ethiopians to kill and die. Um, it does not going to achieve any strategic objective, but it may also be a way of buying time so that he can rearm and, and constitute uh, new alliances. It's, it's, it's a deeply disturbing, reckless and irresponsible uh, um, war strategy on Abbey's side. What makes this conflict even more catastrophic is that Ethiopia provides peacekeepers for African nations fighting terrorism across the continent. In places like Somalia, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, Tanzania, Mozambique, with half of the Ethiopian Defense Force decimated in this conflict, can any of those peacekeeping operations actually continue? Or will Ethiopia pull its forces back to maintain control in their own country and take the boot off of the neck of groups like Al-Shabaab fighting in Somalia? There's two issues here. First is the capacity. Can they afford to, to have um, some of their remaining troops stationed in neighboring countries? Um, and Sudan will obviously not welcome having uh, Ethiopian peacekeepers on its territory. It has them on in the in Abia district on the north-south border. But the other issue is that in order to qualify for the peacekeeping operations, um, armies have to meet uh, human rights standards. And the Ethiopian National Defense Force, having previously been renowned for its disciplined behavior, its uh, uh, very low levels of, of, of sexual violence, etc., is now in disrepute and it's very 
unlikely that it will qualify for international peace operations on those grounds. So without the proper materials to be able to fight a war, what options does Tigray have open to it? What is it hoping to achieve through this conflict? The immediate political strategy of the what, what the government of Tigray, which is the the, the entity that um, has been restored in in, in Mekele, includes the TPLF, the Tigray Defence Forces, etc. There, they've published their seven points for negotiation, and among them, there is a commitment to sticking with the Ethiopian Constitution. And the Ethiopian Constitution obviously allows for self-determination up to and including separation. But in that statement, what the Tigrayans are doing is they are saying, we are not going to unilaterally invoke any any separation option. We're really putting the ball back in the court of the federal government, which of course is is, um, ignoring any political opening um, for now. That said, I think it's it's very unlikely that uh, a, a move towards separation by the Tigrayans, whether constitutional or not, would gain any enthusiasm or, or indeed recognition internationally. Obviously, the net around Tigray is pretty tight at the moment. No supplies are getting through. Starvation, disease, famine and violence are skyrocketing in the pocket. Is Arby hoping to use starvation as the weapon that will win him this war? The events are moving fast in, in, in Ethiopia. Abiy has um, still has a fervent set of followers um, among the Pentecostalists, among the people who still believe in this myth of the greater imperial Ethiopia. But um, his, his, his more realistically minded backers in, in the army uh, in the political establishment and the business community are horrified at his recklessness at actually um, bringing about and escalating a, a war and causing economic chaos. So whether or not he will actually be able to retain power in any meaningful sense, he may remain a, a, you know, head of the government, but his actual power is really diminishing by the day. With how decentralized Ethiopia is, Are there other parts of the country that may be looking at this war as a precursor for crackdowns on their provinces in the future? You know, how do ethnic Somalis in the Ogadan region in eastern Ethiopia view this conflict? The rhetoric that he is indulging in includes calling on the Amhara to protect and defend their land. So it is an Amhara territorial agenda um, along with us and, and claims calling out for Ethiopian nationalist agenda. Now, the problem with highlighting an Amhara territorial agenda is it's not just going to be against the Tigrayans. The Oromos in particular are deeply alarmed at such an agenda. So his war mobilization is actually a very divisive ethnic mobilization. It's a recipe for fermenting um, civil war in Ethiopia, across the entirety of Ethiopia. If Tigray does achieve its independence, do you think other regions of Ethiopia will also look to pull away from the Ethiopian state? I think the, the, the process of the fragmentation of Ethiopia is proceeding more rapidly than the uh, process of, of the, the Tigrayans actually beginning to organise themselves for, for independence. That said, if the if, if if Tigray were to become independent in some way, it would be difficult to see how that would not, in some manner, spark um, fragmentation in Ethiopia. Is there any concentrated effort from the international community to convince Abiy to step back from this war before it gets much worse? The International community, including the diplomatic community and the United Nations and Addis Ababa, has been putting enormous pressure on Abiy to provide humanitarian supplies to, to Tigray. And he is doing less than the minimum. I mean, there are you know, a, a, a few flights, a few convoys. They, they're, they're literally a drop in the bucket. Um, so clearly there is no serious intent to on, on Abby's part to, to, to comply with that pressure. And in refusing to do so, the situation is 
is, is, is unfolding, is, is, is escalating, with the Tigrayans determined to break the siege themselves. So the, the, the question posed now to the international community is less, how do we uh, break the status quo in terms of, of an Ethiopian government attempt to besiege Tigray, and more, how do we prevent um, a slide into state failure? And what would state failure mean to the overall East African region? Um, it would be calamitous. Um, the uh, Ethiopia has been the the the, sort of the central pillar of stability in the region. It's a very large country; it can generate huge numbers of refugees. Um, it can get involved in destabilizing uh, neighboring countries, and none of which are in particularly good shape. Um, themselves. So it, it, it is a truly scary prospect. What do you think are the best case and worst case scenarios over, let's say, the next six months of this conflict? Um, let me put it over the next six weeks, because I, I don't think we have six months. Um, I think the best case is that the uh, Atlantic Alliance, that is the United States and Europe, step up and are able to broker some sort of talks, negotiations between Addis Ababa and Tigray in order to um, create a ceasefire, to create some form of, of um, interim administration in, in Addis Ababa, because I think it's now clear that um, Abiy has, has lost the trust and has lost and whatever capacity he had for serious peacemaking or negotiation has been lost. Also to, to provide the essential humanitarian relief to prevent the um, rapidly unfolding famine in Tigray. That's the best case scenario. The worst case is that the current trajectory of different forms of escalation, the, the um, uh, ethnic incitement um, and genocidal mobilization by Abiy, the uh, continuing uh, military uh, advances of, of the Tigrayans, for whom this is all or nothing, and the uh, entanglement in Sudan and the politics of the Nile Valley lead to state collapse and, 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 and a wider regional conflict. And which one do you think is most likely? I th- I'm, I'm quite pessimistic. So you project that the genocidal mobilization, the state collapse of Ethiopia, as well as the regional consequences that come from that, are the most likely outcome here? I am afraid it is. Yeah. Ethiopia was the torchbearer here, the nation keeping the lid on many of the conflicts in the region. And in the space of a few months... All of the decades of work and progress in East Africa are melting away. The regions of Ethiopia now stand on a knife's edge, fearing that if Tigray is besieged and crushed, their regional autonomy may be next on the chopping block. But if Tigray wins, it may bring back minority rule, or worse, the very collapse of Ethiopia itself, escalating this from a two-way civil war to a regional free-for-all. As a side effect of this, Ethiopia is losing its peacekeeping ability. Its troops were holding down terrorist groups around the region. But now they're being called back. And Alphys like Al-Shabaab will have a free hand to gain momentum and reverse the progress made in nations like Somalia. Years of fighting and progress will be gone. And this is all happening whilst the conflict is localized to Ethiopia. The moment the Tigrayans break through the Sudanese border, Sudan will have to make a delicate choice. Continue their blockade of the Tigrayans and lose their one bit of leverage in the dam disputes, and also risk the Tigrayans citing trouble in their border regions, something the relatively new government in Khartoum cannot afford. Or the Sudanese can join the fight and try and swing a sledgehammer at the regional power that is Ethiopia's knees taking this short window to knock their opponent down. But then it becomes international. From that point, 
Egypt and Sudan will have to go on one side, which means Turkey and the UAE will likely jump in on the other. Both sides are desperately hoping to not escalate up to that point. But that's the choice. I don't think Ethiopia anticipated any of this, but it is what's reality. And the reality is that this conflict may be the shattering of East Africa's future. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. It's been a very long fortnight here at the Redline offices. We were going to bring you a piece on a certain European island this week, but with what we saw and what we see happening and the developments on the ground unfolding in Tigray, we had to get this piece out. This entire episode was edited, recorded, cleaned, researched, and put together in just under two weeks. And to pull that off, it was mostly thanks to my fantastic team. If you want to follow up on the piece or simply ask me a question about Degray, you can get in contact with us on any of our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and from this week, TikTok on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to find myself personally, you can find me on the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show would not be possible without the support of our amazing Patreons who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep this show going. Our Patreons get to join in on games nights, live Q&As, and get extra materials from the show like transcriptions. Their donations 100% go back into the program and help us pay for stuff like staff, programs, hostings, websites, and all the essentials for running a show like this. I really cannot thank our Patreons nearly enough for their support, and if you feel like you can spare a couple of dollars a week, we would greatly appreciate it. As usual, here are our three book recommendations if you want to take this subject even further. The first is The Ethiopian Eritrean Wars by Tom Cooper for a good understanding of the rise of the TPLF. The second is Evil Days, 30 Years of War and Famine in Ethiopia by Alex Duval, a great insight into how the country's situation has been unfolding for decades now. And the third is The State of Africa by Martin Meredith for a look at Africa's post-colonial history and how many of the patterns we see in places like the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo seem to be unfolding elsewhere. I want to say thanks to our guests this week as well, Chetel Tronville, Alan Boswell, and Alex Duval. All three of you were absolutely amazing this week and were incredibly accommodating to our schedule here at the show this week. With us trying to be as up-to-date as we possibly could with what's happening on the ground here, all these guys had to film and shoot and do everything in just a few days. This was the second time Alan and Alex have been on the show, and I'm very sure Chettle will also be invited back. They were absolutely phenomenal guests. As I said at the start of this postscript, it's been a very long fortnight for the Redline team, so I want to give a big thanks to Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zavella, research for assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. All of you poured some serious hours and effort this week, and I cannot thank you enough for it. I am incredibly proud of the team we have here at the show, and I think you can see why. And the last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. We're looking like this month may once again shatter our record for most streams in a month, and that's just incredible. I cannot begin to thank each and every one of you enough for all of the support you guys are giving to the show. I view myself as the luckiest man alive for everything you guys have done here for us. So once again, thank you. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.